Welcome back, my fellow assassins, to another episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. So, it's it's no secret that uh, Intel MacBooks and Macs in general are going the way of the dinosaurs. Uh, so, if you're unfamiliar, uh, back in 2020, Apple announced they were going to be transitioning from Intel or x86 over to their own Apple Silicon or ARM-based processors. Um, and since this time, since this announcement, Mac Macs in general have been dropping like flies from the support list for the latest versions of Mac OS. And this year was no different. Um, so if you haven't uh, listened to the previous episode of the Dark Assassins podcast where we covered WWDC, um, I highly encourage you to go listen to that after you listen to this episode. But they unveiled their new version of Mac OS like they always do at WWDC. And even more Intel Macs just dropped like flies when it came to support, even some of the more capable ones. Now, I don't want to go you know, re- reiterate things I said there in, that, in the previous episode. But put simply, they uh, removed support for some very capable machines like 2015 and 2016 MacBook Pros. Yet, for some strange reason, they still are supporting the 2017 MacBook, 12-inch MacBook. I mean, I'm not sure if you know about that machine, but that thing has a disgustingly underpowered Intel CPU that struggles to do anything, overheats like crazy, and is just a terrible machine. Yet somehow that can run the latest version of Mac OS, but uh, computers that are significantly more powerful and more capable can't. Um, so, you know, that makes sense, right? Um, so with how quickly Intel MacBooks have been dropping like flies, that raises the question, when will Intel be killed entirely? Uh, now, obviously, that's a pretty hard question to give a definitive date on, um, but they are, without a doubt, being killed very quickly. Um, before, it used to be like, you know, the the oldest version that was supported on the previous version of macOS, that one would be dropped and could kind of successfully increment up like that. Um, but yeah, this year they just, they just killed multiple, like they, they, they didn't just kill the 2015s, they killed the 2015s and the 2016s when it comes to the MacBook Pros. So with how quickly they're killing them, it's, it's kind of hard to say and give an exact date based on, you know, what they would do previously. Um, but one thing we do have to keep in mind is they produced Intel MacBooks and Macs in general as recently as 2020. Um, so the most recent, uh, I believe it was a 13-inch MacBook Pro, uh, they had released in 2020 that ran on Intel. And you can even still buy um, Intel-based Macs, that being the 2019 Mac Pro and the quote-unquote high-end uh, Mac Mini, which if you're considering buying that Intel Mac Mini because it's more expensive and considered the quote-unquote high-end one, you're wasting your money because the M1 is by far way better in every stretch of the imagination, unless for some reason you need to use like boot camp or something on your Mac Mini. Then, of course, the Intel one's better, but it's definitely not more powerful. Um, so with this in mind, personally, I don't really see them dropping the Intel Mac Pro and that thing losing support anytime soon, personally. Um, I mean, if we look look back, the uh, 20, 2013 Mac Pro, the trash can Mac Pro, that one just got cut this year from the latest version that got announced, and that gives it nine years of support. So if we factor that in, that means the current Mac Pro from 2019 would be supported until 2028. Um, but realistically, as far as Macs in general, personally, I could see the date where they get dropped at 2025 at the earliest and 2027 at the latest. Um, again, with that ex possible exception of maybe 2028 for the Mac Pro. But yeah, sometime between 2025 and 2027, I think, is when 
virtually all the Macs, if not all the Macs, are going to be gone the way of the dinosaurs. Uh, but as long as there is um, Intel Mac supported, that means currently unsupported Intel Macs still have a shot at being able to run uh, the current latest version of Mac OS. Now, you might be thinking, how, how, how can that happen? If, if Apple killed the support for my Mac, what can I do? So there's a tool out there called the Open Core Legacy Patcher, uh, which I have linked in the show notes below if you want to go check it out. Um, and this basically just allows unsupported Macs to run the latest version of macOS natively without any kind of firmware patches or anything like that. Now, you might be wondering, how does this work? Um, so basically what it does is um, it tricks macOS into thinking that you have a newer system that's actually supported, so it'll install it for you. But one thing to keep in mind with Open Core is you have to rerun the, uh, the patcher after every update, and the main reason for this is when you update macOS, the, because your Mac, Mac isn't supported, things like maybe your graphics drivers, for example, won't be added in, will be deleted from the operating system because it's not supported. So you have to basically rerun the patcher in order to you know, bring those drivers back into the operating system so you'll have a nice experience. Which, I mean, it's kind of... I mean, it's not that bad, to be honest. I've used multiple Macs on a daily basis that uh, use Open Core, and with how rarely Mac OS gets updated, um, it's really not that big of a deal just to have to rerun that thing once in a, you know, I don't know, maybe every other month or every three months or something like that. It's pretty infrequent, so it's really not that big of a deal. Um, so going more into how Open Core works, uh, back in the days of yore, when Mac OS was built for multiple architectures like PowerPC and Intel or 32-bit and 64-bit Intel, and now... Um, it's built for Intel and ARM. Uh, basically, what OpenCore is able to do is it's able to pull down the uh, the Intel-based version of Mac OS because you're running an Intel system. And it's, it can use that installer and that version of Mac OS to be able to install it on your machine. Which this is why, if you go to the that Open Core page I was talking about, there's a hard cutoff at 64-bit machines, and this is because there is no 32-bit version of Mac OS anymore. Now, there's many reasons why 32-bit uh, version CPUs and platforms can't run 64-bit uh, operating systems and applications, but Put simply, the architectures are just completely different, and the registers that the CPU uses to access memory and whatnot are just completely incompatible, uh, because 32 bits are is obviously smaller than 64. So if you try to shove a 64-bit, you know, register into a 32-bit one, you're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> um, so that's that's part of the reason why. So this kind of comes into the idea of, you know, once Intel isn't supported anymore, what are you going to do? Um, but yeah, so, yeah, this is why Intel is key, since as long as there's an Intel build around, Open Core as it exists now we'll, should be able to find workarounds to be able to get the latest versions of Mac OS installed onto your system. Now, it could potentially be a little bit more difficult once, say, you, whatever platform of the Mac you're trying to install it on is supported. So, for example, if you're running a 2012 MacBook Pro and we get to the point where the only Intel-based Macs that are supported is, say, the Mac Pro, then it's maybe a little more ambiguous on being able to trick uh, the operating system into thinking that you're a supported Mac because you're running Intel, yet there is no version of the MacBook Pro that runs Intel that's supported. So there could be some it, potential issues there, but I think overall the community will be community will, community will be able to find a workaround. Excuse me. So. 
that's kind of why you know Intel is necessary because ARM based CPUs and Intel or x86 based CPUs have completely different instruction sets. Now in layman's terms what this means is they speak completely different languages. So if you try to give an instruction set or a language that was specifically made for say an x86 or an Intel CPU, if you give that to an ARM CPU, it's going to have no idea what you're talking about. And it works the same in reverse. So they just can't execute instructions written for one another, which kind of makes sense. So if you think about it like this, if you imagine your boss gives you a checklist of things that they want you to do for the day, um, if that's in English, I mean, you have no problem. You can do that, no problem. But say if they, for whatever reason, they give you that list in Chinese or some other language that you don't know, well, uh, good luck with that. Because uh, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time trying to understand what you do. Uh, unless, for whatever reason, you're multilingual and you understand that language. But it should be noted, uh, CPUs are not uh, multilingual. The only way that CPUs can work around things like that and interpret multiple languages is through some kind of virtualization, which is, you know, kind of like a software layer that translates the uh, whatever the current instruction set or language that it's given by the, the OS or application or whatever and translates it into what the CPU can actually understand. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's very slow when you do this through software like that and causes a major hit to performance. Um, so that's kind of the big reason why Intel is necessary for current versions of patchers like this to exist because they use the Intel version to run. If you don't have the Intel version, you are going to run into some major problems, which we're going to get into here in, uh, later on in the episode. So th the idea of translating applications like Intel apps into Apple Silicon-based apps or ARM apps is not impossible. I mean, it's been done. It is done. Apple did it through their program called Rosetta 2. Uh, basically, how this works is when you first launch an Intel-based app, um, the OS can detect that it's an Intel app, and then it'll translate that binary or that ins list of instructions that are written for Intel into Apple Silicon or ARM instructions so that your Mac is able to actually understand it. So in English, basically, Rosetta 2 translates the application, which was written in a language, in the language for the Intel CPU, and translates it into the language for the Apple Silicon one, so it can actually understand it and run it. Although, it should be noted that even though it does translate it, and now it's the code is native, native in Apple Silicon's language, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and that's because the instruction sets used in x86, which is Intel, and ARM, which is Apple Silicon, they're different instruction sets. So how you go about, say, doing a for loop in x86 is potentially different than how it's done in ARM. So sure, you can you know, translate them uh, between one another and get them to run natively. But the problem is, is you lose that optimization that you had when you had it natively compiled into whatever um, architecture you originally built it for. So this is kind of where uh, the whole optimization thing is the big key. So while yes, you will be having it run natively, performance wise, you're not gonna have experienced the same level of performance as if you natively compiled uh, that program, which is why if you if you've seen any kind of like videos or benchmarks done on applications with Apple Silicon Max, you'll notice that um, once the application is finally translated into be native uh, ARM to be be written specifically for Apple Silicon, the performance gains are just the the performance is just so much better than when it was written through Rosetta. Um, which is, I mean, like we said, because it's not optimized for ARM even when you translate it. It's optimized after 
uh, you build it specifically for ARM. So we've mentioned in previous episodes of the Dark Sats podcast that when you try to build an application, you can't just always build one application and have it run across different operating systems. So the same thing holds true when you're writing for different architectures, like different CPU architectures. And anyone that was uh, messing around with computers, you know, back in the 80s knows this very well. Um, Just because you can have the same application or game or whatever work on multiple um, CPUs, but you basically have to recompile it and rewrite it Um, for each one of the different architectures that you're writing for. And the nice thing about Apple is they actually already do this in Xcode. So if you already have an Xcode project and you're running any of the latest or any of the newer versions of Xcode since Apple Silicon's been a thing, it already builds both Intel and ARM-based versions for you into the executable, which I believe they called universal apps. So... It'll have, you know, the instructions and builds for um, for x86 and for ARM, which is which is pretty cool. Um, one thing I've noticed playing around with it is the the executables are definitely bigger than if you say you just build it natively on a an x86 platform. Which I mean, you, you that's kind of what you expect, right? You know, you have essentially the same application but written for both architectures. So that's kind of what you expect. So now comes the question of, is it even possible to, to have Intel Max run the latest version of Mac OS when the only supported versions, or the only supported Macs are Apple Silicon based? So theoretically, yes. Practically, no. <laughs> And why, why do I say that? So theoretically, you could, um, but you're going to have to overcome some major hurdles. And even if you do overcome those major hurdles, there's going to be some major drawbacks to it. So the first thing is, you have we, we kind of mentioned this before, but you have to trick macOS into thinking that your Mac is supported. Now, currently, this is already done with OpenCore. So theoretically adjusting it to work when only Apple Silicon is supported shouldn't be too challenging um, since you should be able to easily just bypass the checks or modify the conditions that you know Mac OS is looking for when you're installing it so your computer passes um, so it can go ahead with the install. Um, and then I kind of see a few different options of how you could work through this. So. The first of which is just virtualization, which really, it's honestly not that great of a solution, but it's probably one of the more easy ones to implement. Um, So as we mentioned in previous episodes um, with virtualization, um, it's basically running through, you're basically running, you'd be running macOS through some kind of translation layer. So this by default will be a hit to performance. Um, So you're not going to have, you know, the same kind of, you know, power and efficiency that you would, you know, running it natively on bare metal hardware because you're running through this uh, layer of translation. So in practice, basically how I see this working is theoretically you could create some kind of hypervisor which if you're not familiar with that is, it's basically just a way that allows you to run virtual machines. Um, and you basically install Mac OS on that hypervisor. Then comes the challenge of configuring that hypervisor to basically bypass booting into the hypervisor and boot you directly into Mac OS and kind of make it appear that Mac OS is the only thing there um, to give you a more native feeling um and then obviously you would pretend you could have the possibility to configure it where if you know you say you hold down some um key combination or whatever that you could uh you know boot into the to hype to the hypervisor itself and you know make any modifications that you need um but i think this would probably 
be the easiest solution to implement. Obviously, it's not going to be easy at all, but um, it, it theoretically, it might be the easiest. But like I said, because you're going through virtualization, you're going to have that translation layer, and you're going to experience some performance hits. So the second option would be doing basically Rosetta 2, but in reverse. Um, and this, this option is it's going to be painful. Uh, there, there's no way around it. Um, this, this implementation, someone would basically have to write a program and patch it into the operating system that would basically do all the translate, translation for you like before anything's even run. So you'd basically have to have this application inside the installer, for example, that whenever it's trying to do something, automatically translate it to Intel and you basically have to as the installer is trying to install things which theoretically is written in ARM instructions because it's meant to be run on an ARM system aka Apple Silicon you basically have to translate everything into Intel so you can run it on your Intel system so half doing that is going to be a <laughs> A real pain you basically have to be a super whiz in both Intel and ARM assembly in order to be able to come up with a program that could do this um, and it would if you think installing an operating system now takes a long time you ain't seen nothing yet with this guy <laughs> because you have to not only do you have to ins take the time that it usually takes to install but you also have to take the time that it takes to completely translate everything from, you know, ARM assembly into x86 assembly so you can run it on your Intel machine. So that's going to be a royal pain. The good news about that is once, theoretically, if you could do this, once the operating system was installed, you would have a natively running Intel operating system versus uh, basically an Intel version of Mac OS on your system. But like we mentioned previously, when we talked about Rosetta 2, that's not going to be optimized at all because the code was originally written to be compiled into ARM, but because the instruction sets are different, the translation's not going to be perfect. So therefore you're going to lose some optimization there. So you're not going to be quite as fast. Um, but the other issue that you run into with this solution is because every supported Mac would be Mac OS or Apple Silicon based, anytime you downloaded a new application onto your computer, this translator would have to be run again to basically do what Rosetta 2 is doing right now, but just in reverse. So that would kind of be a pain. But like Rosetta 2, um, once it's done once, you'd be good to go. But the other problem is every time there's a software update, if you want to stay on up to date on all the software updates, you would have to this that translation process that we talked about, going through the actual installer and having to translate everything before you can actually install, you'd have to do that all again while you, every time you update because there ain't no way in heck those updates are going to be x86 or Intel based. They're going to be based for Apple Silicon because that's the only version of macOS that exists now is Apple Silicon uh, builds of macOS. So that would make your updates take an excruci excruciatingly long uh, to complete. So that's not great either. Um, so then the third option is essentially baking in a hypervisor into macOS. So you're basically taking option one, except rather than actually having a hypervisor, you built that software translation layer into macOS itself. So this idea of baking something into the installer is not out of the ordinary. I mean, you'd have to do it for the Rosetta 2 and reverse method too. Um, but basically, this patch would be even more complex in the sense that 
you'd need to trick the installer and macOS as a whole into thinking that this patch is actually the CPU. So it'll send all the instructions to this piece of software, which will basically act as a software translation layer and a bridge between your CPU and the operating system. And the, w the reason you would need to do that is because, you know, like I said, the, oper the operating system, macOS, would be written for ARM-based assembly, but you're trying to run it on an x86 or an Intel-based machine, so you can't do it. So you'd have to somehow translate it um, in order to make it work. But the reason why this is different than Rosetta 2, the Rosetta 2 in reverse option, is you'd be this application is essentially would be having to do all the translation in real time every time rather than just a one time thing. So as far as like the installs and the updates are concerned, if you got this solution working, it would be probably quicker than doing updates and installs with this Rosetta 2 in reverse option but the overall experience would be a heck of a lot slower. Um, if you've ever looked at like graphs on speed comparisons between programming languages, you're essentially talking about the speed difference between a programming language like C++ or C compared to Python, which if you haven't seen those comparisons, it's not even close. Python gets smoked and get circles run around it by C and C++. And the reason why is because Python is an interpreted language, which means the code is basically interpreted at runtime rather than C and C++, whose code is converted down to the CPU's language, or basically straight to the assembly that can be run very quickly. So essentially, you'd be running your OS as an interpreted language which would be uh, not a good time, uh, especially if you're running a, uh, if you're somehow, if in this distant future, you're uh, rocking an Intel Mac that has a spinning hard drive, R.I.P. <laughs> you ain't going to be doing anything on that machine. Um, with how, if, if this is the option that is, is, is gone with because just of how slow it would be, um, because there, you'd have to, I mean, since you're doing all the translation in real time, like your toast since there, there's just no way I can see this version being that usable. I mean, as far as like convenience wise, it's definitely a great option convenience wise because everything's just in the the operating system. You don't have to worry about tra doing a ton of translation stuff um, every time a new application is is run or every time you're trying to you know install a new update, you don't have to worry about you know translating that. but at the same time, like everything just gets translated, you know, every time. The, but, you know, you're in addition to the fact that you have to essentially interpret the uh, the ARM instructions, translate them into x86, run them. You're also dealing with the the uh, the problem we've been discussing, which is the fact that, yeah, sure, you translated the the uh, assembly into x86 but it's not optimized <laughs> so not only are you dealing with unoptimized code but you're also dealing dealing with having to translate this code also at runtime so the performance is just going to be absolutely abysmal um and personally i don't i don't know how effective that's going to be now i guess you could say you know who knows come like you know, whenever this finally happens, when Intel finally gets dumped and there is no more Intel build for macOS, maybe there'll be some tool out there that can, you know, perform these um, translations a lot quicker and make, you know, very 
not you know perfectly optimized code but you know more optimized code than what it would be but yeah as it stands right now that I don't that that would, that would be a pretty rough experience uh, in my opinion so then the fourth option I see is essentially just completely reverse engineering Mac OS and making it an open source project but that begs the question of is this even Mac OS anymore and why that why this begs the question of is it even Mac OS anymore is because you have to think about it this way the development lines are completely different you essentially have one team at Apple creating Mac OS and you have this open source community team that's basically trying to copy everything they're doing so you have two completely different code bases so is it even the same application anymore and another thing to think about is say that you do have these two different code bases the the thing is is even if you were able to reverse engineer mac os which by the way good luck with that with how closely integrated it is with ios and ipad os and all those continuity features that they built in trying to reverse engineer that without you know already having reverse engineered ios or ipad os or any of the other apple operating systems that's going to be a royal pain in the butt i mean but okay let's say hypothetically you manage to do that even still your code would not be one to one with apple's code and the reason for this is there's so many different ways that you can write the same application like one person can write a calculator application one way the other person another person can write the calculator application in a different way still the same calculator still calculates everything correctly but the code's different so in addition to having completely separate development lines completely separate code bases even the code itself would not be the same so it kind of begs the question like could you even consider that um mac os at that point because like it's kind of not like it's kind of its own it would kind of almost be its own operating system at that point because in addition to having you know different implementations of the code you would have different bugs and security vulnerabilities in different ones in you know the official mac os version versus the open source version because like I said, because you're structuring the code differently because the open source community would be reverse engineering it, they might have coded their, you know, how the, the operating system, say, handles file I.O., for example, different than how the Apple dev team did it, which means there could be bugs in the, say, the open source version that isn't in the official macOS version, which could have vulnerabilities that wouldn't be in the macOS version. Similarly, you know, maybe the Apple team added a feature that has a vulnerability and a bug in it, but the way that the open source community dev developed it, they since they did it differently to get the same outcome, it doesn't have that vulnerability. So there's just there would just be so many differences that it's it'd be hard to, you know, justify that it would even be considered Mac OS at that point. Plus, I mean, there is absolutely zero way that Apple is going <laughs> to open source their operating system and any of their software. I mean, especially their pro apps that they're charging you money for. There's no way they're going to open source that. As much as the open source community would probably love to have Mac OS become open source, it's I just never personally see that happening. Um, so, I mean, the, the, so because of that, the community would have to completely rewrite the operating system from the ground up, which like I've been kind of alluding to personally, I just, I just don't think that's feasible, um, for the community to be able to recreate Mac OS. And in addition to keep, uh, recreate Mac OS, keep, a, keep up with all the new features that Apple puts in, especially those continuity features. Um, I just, I just don't see it possible. I mean, that's not to say that the open source community can't create their own operating system that's really good because they have it's called linux um so they definitely can 
if they did, you know, pull themselves together, they honestly their best shot of recreating macOS from the ground up is basically take the Linux kernel and build macOS on top of it, which would give them a pretty close start because if you're unfamiliar, macOS and Linux are ba- both based on Unix, which is kind of a similar way of doing things, um, to put simply. Windows is completely different. But because the similarity between Linux and macOS, if you took the Linux kernel, you would at least have a pretty good foundation that you could then build upon um, to get your way to macOS. So if they would try to rebuild macOS from the ground up, that's probably the starting block that they would take but I mean even that then you're getting and again into the question is it even mac os at that point at that point it's just linux with a mac os skin essentially unless you somehow manage to figure out all the features specific to mac os that aren't in linux um but personally I think if the community did do that it would probably just be called like you know some linux version of that you know looks like mac os um but another thing that you'd have to keep in mind is that there might some features that Apple would implement just might not simply be possible to recreate due to you know hardware limitations. Um, since with Apple Silicon now they're able to do a lot more complex stuff, which is basically locking out um, older Intel Macs anyway. So there are some features you know that only exist on Apple Silicon because of what Apple Silicon can do. So trying to recreate that might not even be possible in the first place due to those hardware limitations. Um, Plus, I mean, the community would essentially have to treat this like a full-time job um, because trying to keep up with Apple would just be a task all on its own um, because anytime Apple would unveil a new feature, You'd have to reverse engineer that feature, figure out how they did it, and then implement it. So even if the community was able to, you know, make their own version of macOS, say, based off the Linux kernel, um, they would be easily months behind where Apple is when it comes to, like, software feature updates because they would have to take the time to... Well, first off, they would have to like download they would have to have an apple silicon based computer anyway in order to you know download mac os figure out how it works and be able to reverse engineer it and that takes time you know reverse engineering things like this it's not you know a simple overnight process like you'd have to completely re-engineer it that takes time and then you have to implement it test it debug it push it to production you know all this stuff so you're talking easily being months behind Apple as far as feature releases go at best, if not even more than that, like years behind. So hypothetically, yes, the community could do it, but I I don't know. I just have a hard time believing that they would be able to keep up, um, you know, with all the updates and the features and everything. Um, but the good news is, hypothetically, if this did happen, as far as performance goes, this would be by far the best performance out of all the solutions so far because it would be open source. You could build the code natively for Intel machines and everything would work beautifully um, if you could actually get this to work. Um, the uh, <laughs> Although, on the other hand, um, if you did create a an open source version of macOS um, by reverse engineering it... Um, I, I would just say uh, make sure you have a good lawyer <laughs> because Apple will definitely be coming for you um, in regards to lawsuits uh, because that's their proprietary software. I mean, I guess you could argue it's your own interpretation of it and it's different, so you might be able to win it. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that Apple would be definitely trying to sue you. Um, and you'd probably also run into issues... Um, as far as like copyrights concerned, you know, like if you reverse and like, sure you could reverse engineer it, but then if you tried to use, you know, the same names for applications, like, um, 
Pages or Final Cut Pro or Logic Pro or something like that, you're, you're running into lawsuit territory. Now, I guess if you somehow really, really manage to reverse engineer it, if you somehow manage to get like all the encryption and authentication stuff that Apple uses, which personally I have no idea how you'd be able to do that without actually working at Apple, you know, to figure that stuff out. If you did manage to do that and be able to like connect to Apple servers and all that kind of stuff to be able to, you know, download stuff from the app store, I, I don't know that, but then you run into the problem. Okay, sure. You reverse engineered the operating system. You reverse engineered all the Apple default apps. What about everything else? <laughs> because sure, you can reverse engineer the operating system and say you made a perfect one-to-one macOS clone that can run on Intel. If macOS is only natively supported, so if Apple themselves are only making builds for ARM or Apple Silicon-based systems, that means all the applications that you could download for them would also only be... um, Apple Silicon based. So you would again have to, inside of your macOS clone that you managed to create, you would have to essentially build in that reverse Rosetta 2 thing anyway, because you'd have to translate all the apps that you downloaded in, back into Intel, um, which I guess would, would be potentially a benefit of you know, making it based on Linux, then you could just use Linux packages that are already Intel-based and you wouldn't have that problem. But then again, you run into the issue of what if I want to use, you know, Final Cut Pro or iMovie or Pages or, you know, any of the other macOS apps that you could download from the App Store. Um, You'd basically have to write those yourself because uh, Apple would no longer be providing Intel-based versions. Although... I guess theoretically you could, on the App Store, I, you could potentially maybe find a way to download, or if someone has a repository of old Intel-based versions of these apps, you could theoretically just install those, and you could kind of get around it that way. Um, but then you run into the problem of you never get updates for those, <laughs> because the only updates would be Apple Silicon-based. Um, so yeah, out of all these options, I I don't know with how it stands right now, personally, I don't think any of them are all that great. Um, they all have major limitations either when it comes to implementing them or their overall functionality. I, I just, I just personally, I just don't see it. Um, I, I would love that once... Apple fully switches over to Intel, uh, the community can find some way of, or sorry, once Apple fully switches over to Apple Silicon um, and doesn't have an Intel build of macOS anymore. I hope that the open source community can find a way, but with with how things are right now, I just, I, I just don't really see it being that realistic that any Intel Macs are going to be able to be supported on the latest version of Mac OS once Apple goes full Apple Silicon based. Now that's not to say that, you know, open core is just going to be poof gone after that. I'm sure the people that run the open core project will probably continue, continue to run it. And rather than supporting Intel based Macs, they'll support um, the Apple Silicon based Macs that eventually get dropped when their time comes. Um, And I think It'll come to the point where Intel machines will go the way of, you know, 32-bit machines now where, sure, they're running Intel, but they're running, they have, you know, 32-bit, so they can't, aren't compatible with the 64-bit Mac OS version that is out now. So I think, I I just don't see a way that Intel Macs are going to be able to survive um, when Apple Silicon fully takes over and Apple only has... An Apple Silicon build. Um, 
So I want to hear from you guys. What do you think about this? my analysis here of unsupported Macs in a post-Intel future? Um, I, now, this isn't to say that Intel Macs aren't going to be useful because you can still, you know, run Intel Macs that are, you know, running Catalina or running LCAP or High Sierra or, you know, any of these other older operating systems, and they still work great. Um, you would just have to make sure that you could find different applications like web browsers, for example, that would be supported since as you get older and older on web browsers, you know, modern, you know, web standards change and they those web browsers kind of get dropped from support. Um, so theoretically, even once Apple Silicon fully takes over and you can no longer update to the latest version of Mac OS, that's not to say that your Intel Macs are completely gone. Um, so you'll still be able to use them, just running them on the latest version. In my opinion, once there is only ARM-based builds or Apple Silicon builds, I don't think you'll be able to uh, be able to update there. But, you know, as the time gets closer, um, maybe things will change. Maybe there'll be some option that comes in. But, yeah, right now, I, I personally don't see it. Um, but, yeah, let me know your thoughts. Send me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com. Um, post a comment in a rating and review. Um, that you'll leave. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, I ask that you leave a rating and review and subscribe to the Dark Assassins podcast if you haven't done so already. And also be sure to share with a friend or family member who might be interested to uh, learn about the future of Intel-based Macs in a post-Intel future. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email at con that you want answered or about this episode. Uh, shoot me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com or click the link down in the show notes below. And that's going to do it for me in this episode of the Dark Assassins podcast. Until next time, my fellow assassins, remember, bull nothing equals true. If action not equal to null, return true. I'll see you next time on the Dark Assassins Podcast. Thank you.